Yes. <laughs> that actually worked. <coughs> oh, wow. Um, I, I suppose I should uh, show more faith in my powers, really, but I <laughs> totally didn't think that was going to work. Um, uh, well, uh, here I am uh, to talk um, uh, rather appropriately about magic in this video, which has been sponsored by The Great Corsets Plus. Or has it? Maybe it hasn't. Maybe it's been sponsored by someone else. You see, I can, I can summon this logo like this, and then I can just change it, and I can make it disappear. What's going on? Well, <laughs> find out later. Now, magic. There are, ty there are different meanings to the word magic, and I have to define my terms to make it clear. You see, um, there's this sort of magic, isn't there, where I, I take this perfectly ordinary wooden pencil stolen from a perfectly ordinary branch of Ikea, and then I can use my powers. Use my powers to make it go soft and blurry before your very eyes! Look at that! It's all soft and blurry, and I can make it go sharp like this! You see, and now it's all sharp again. How did I do that? Well, it would be wrong to give away the secret of a trick like that because you know, that spoils the magic, doesn't it? And uh, you know, we want to be entertained by this sort of stuff. We want the, the sense of wonder. The Yeah, uh, anyway. So there's that which is really conjuring, isn't it? That's not proper magic. Uh, there's the magic which actually has magical effects in the real world. Except it doesn't, does it? Because I, I, I imagine that you are, uh, as me, uh, in, in, on this, in that you don't really literally believe in actual magic in this, the real world, do you? I mean, you're aware that there are things that exist in the real world, like astrology, that unfortunately does exist in the real world, and you might say, well, that's a form of magic. Well, yes, but you know, importantly, it doesn't actually work. So magic that actually works doesn't exist in this uh, world. We have uh, other things. We have, we have, we have science and, and, and the like, and those things demonstrably do work. Um, but we don't think of them as magic. In fact, uh, the fact that they demonstrably do work is sort of what, mean, what you know, draws a distinction. That's why we think they're not magic. Anyway, but you are also aware, I'm sure, that there are fantasy worlds like Middle-earth and Westeros and the like, where magic does exist, does palpably work. There are wizards who cast lightning bolts and all sorts of very powerful, sometimes, uh, spells. And so the people in those worlds will perhaps be a lot less sceptical. They know that their magic does actually exist. So I'm talking more about that sort of magic, but if there were a fantasy world, a real fantasy world that really had magic in it, then what would that fantasy world be like? Because how would the existence of magic alter things? I, I think there's, there's a certain amount to discuss here. So and that's what I'm going to do. Now, if I can remember uh, when I uh, first saw the Ralph Bakshi uh, version of The Lord of the Rings. He did the first half of The Lord of the Rings in, as a cartoon film. I knew before seeing it that it was a cartoon film. And I was having a conversation with my mother and uh, she said, what sort of film is, is it? And I said, well, it's a cartoon film because obviously they couldn't actually do it live action because it's a fantasy film. I didn't realise what Lord of the Rings was like, though. I hadn't read the book. And I had imagined, I was also unfamiliar with this term fantasy, I was imagining that it would be complete fantasy, that there was, that it wouldn't have mundane things like people and horses and houses in it, because they're all real world things. I thought it was like a totally different, that the characters would be, I don't know, abstract blobs of energy coruscating about the place. I don't know, the fact is, I didn't know what to expect. I was looking forward to just something that was completely wow different, set in this fantasy world, and oh. It's some people. OK, they're called hobbits. They're very short, but they've got a nose, two eyes. They talk English and they seem to have all the same emotions and instincts and they live in a house. Oh, well, all right, their houses look a bit different. They're sort of semi underground, but it's, it's, it's recognisable as a house. And inside the house, they've got oh, tables and chairs and they, they drink cups of tea. Yeah, they're, they're essentially just like us. They're 99 point something percent the same as us. I recognise this world. When they go to Brie, they meet men. And it turns out that most of the people who, who live in this Middle Earth world are not hobbits. They're just men and they're just like us. And magic is, in fact, extremely rare. There, there are only a, a few wizards. There's what? There's a Gandalf the Grey, Saruman the White, Radox the Green, and Badidas the Blue, and that's about it. And most people in Middle Earth have never seen any magic being cast. It's a really rare thing. So, yeah, it's all rather mundane. It's sort of, yeah, it's it's just a medieval world with a few names changed. And elves and dwarves, you might say, oh, they're different, aren't they? No, elves and dwarves, they're essentially just people. The you know, elves and dwarves are tall and thin, and the short and the dwarves are short and squat and got big noses, and that's yeah, they're sort of they're essentially people. 
very recognizable. So I didn't find it tremendously fantastical. But there is some magic, and in other uh, magic, uh, magical worlds like Glorantha, I'm a bit of a fan of the, uh, the, the fictional setting of Glorantha that Greg Stafford came up with and was, uh, uh, later became the background for the game RuneQuest. In that world, magic is really common, and uh, wizards are not rare. In fact, a perfectly ordinary person uh, might cast spells several times during the day. If you're a carpenter, you probably know a spell or two to keep your chisels sharp as you work. If you're, you're trying to find that thing you dropped in the goat barn earlier in the day, but it's gone dark now, a light spell would be pretty handy. Uh, if you need to bash in a load of pegs into this oak beam and they're proving a bit stiff, well, there'll, there'll be a spell for that. So that's the word of world of Glorantha, which has uh, magic is as, as common to ordinary folk. Um, now, if such a world existed, what would people use magic for? Now, so I, I've got on, on shelves here, uh, goodness knows how many rule books for, for, for role-play games set in fantasy worlds, and these, these specify quite clearly what, what a spell does. Oh, it has a duration of five minutes and a range of 30 feet, and it does this. Um, um, but they're almost all for um, making you better at fighting. Um, they, they make your spear do more damage. They, they protect you against incoming arrows uh, and that sort of thing. Um, the, the spells are all very, very uh, geared towards a small number of adventurers going on an adventure, taking on monsters, which of course is convenient for the games, but I don't think actually reflects the reality, not that it's really a reality, but the, the, the pretend reality of a fantasy world that has magic in it. Because well, what do we use our magic for? You could say that we have technology, which is um, doing the job of uh, magic in a lo lot of these, these fantasy worlds. So what do we do with our technology? Well, we, um, we use it to make uh, our jobs easier. So it's easier to get to work because we have a car, and then when you get at work, you've got a digger, which is uh, much better at uh, digging holes than uh, just a guy with a spade. And um, uh, we also make things to make people's lives in general easy. So we make, we make washing machines and, and the like. So we make ordinary people's lives easier, we make jobs easier and more efficient, and a lot of the, the, the job stuff is in the pursuit of wealth. So if you want to get coal out of the ground, because coal is wealth, then machinery that will make that easier and, and will transport it more efficiently afterwards. Yeah, that's good for that's good for wealth. So that's how we use our technology. Um, and uh, most people work in, you know, in, in admin education. Uh, they, they work in offices and factories and the like. Most people are not farmers these days, but of course in the medieval and, and ancient periods, most people were farmers. So that's where the market was. So if you have a, a university developing spells, because spells in almost all these in the fantasy worlds are a form of technology. There's something you have to learn, not everyone has. See, if you just had a, a magical world in which everyone could do anything, that's not an interesting magical world, is it? Um, spells have to be acquired. It is a skill that not everyone has, and that makes the magic interesting. Getting the magic to do the job becomes the story, and then once you've got the magic, you then use it and it does the job. Uh, usually that's a the end of the story, but getting it is the, is the interesting bit. So um, what are these people doing researching spells? Well, what's our classic uh, picture of a magic user? It's an old man, isn't it? Well, why, why, why is that then? Why are they old? Well, there is this notion that magic takes a lot of learning. It's very difficult and you have to be quite bright and read an awful lot of books. And by the time you become a powerful wizard, you're quite old. Um, and uh, why a man? Well, uh, admittedly there is the, the witch, but typically the wizard, uh, the, the, the powerful magic user is, is, is a man. And I suppose that's because, because of that dedication. That, you're going to have to give your life over to becoming a wizard and becoming a powerful one. And most will fail and just a few will make it. It's a very high risk thing and a very long term strategy. And only men tend to go in for that sort of thing. Um, you, you, you might say that men and women are equally intelligent, and yet the vast majority of chess grandmasters are men. And you, you could say, well, that's because only men put the, the dedication in to such a high-risk thing, uh, such a long-term strategy, and, and only them, they really get to benefit from it, because women are just too sensible, and they're far more interested in um, human relationships, and just not many women will throw their lives away dedicated to this weird, abstract, high-risk, you never know, but I probably won't become a grandmaster, but I'll, I'm going to die trying. You can see what I mean. So they, it's, 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 it, it fits in with the way people are, that the old man is, is the wizard, and so they are 
putting all this learning into developing spells, well, why would they do that? They could do it entirely selfishly, of course, but let's imagine that they're not doing it entirely selfishly, that they, that they know that there's a world out there and that this magic can actually help people. So where's the market? Well, it's agriculture, it's ordinary people, and, and it's what they want. So uh, what do people want magic to do ordinarily? Well, um, make them wealthier, so make their jobs easier so that they can, they can get to wealth more readily. Um, they also would quite like to be, uh, you know, attractive, wouldn't they? I mean, that's what we want pretty much all the time. Uh, just think, there are soldiers who want to be able to fight better, but 99.99% of the time, those soldiers are not actually fighting, and very few people are actually soldiers. But everyone, all the time, would like to be tremendously attractive, tremendously handsome, amazingly charming. Yeah, the market for spells for that is, is constant and enormous. That's where the money is to be made, so that's where the research is going to go. Um, what do we do with our, with our medical knowledge? Well, let's see now. Uh, we, we have our medical magic in the real world, and, and how, how, do we, how do we buff ourselves? Yeah, how, do we, how do we use um, that magic to, to enhance ourselves? Well, the surgery is largely, it's largely making women look prettier, sort of, uh, and or younger. Um, you see, men are not um, desperate to have uh, stronger muscles implanted. I want you to take all the muscles out of my upper arm and replace them with stronger ones. Um, I want muscle transplants from, from that, that dead guy there who's, who's got bigger muscles than me. I want extra muscles, graft them because I want to be extra strong, use surgery. It's possible, but people are not doing research into that because we're strong enough to do what we need to do. A, a soldier is strong enough to chop through the flesh, chop, chop through flesh with, with whatever weapons he's got. So, you know, actually, it doesn't need to be that much stronger, but being handsome is always good. You can, and being more charming, that's always good. So, yeah. I think people would probably want that. Um, and uh, so we're using it to uh, make women prettier a bit. Um, and what else? To prolong the life of old people. Over two thirds of the money spent by the British National Health Service, the NHS, goes to uh, prolonging the lives of old people. Yep. Um, and you can imagine that, again, in the fantasy world, a lot of people who are rich and can afford your magic are going to be quite old. And old people, perhaps if they're wealthy, might like to live a bit longer. So, yes, prolonging the life of old people and um, uh, making uh, the harvest more fertile and, um, and, and being more, more, more attractive. I think that's where most spells would go. And none of those spells uh, appears in any of these, 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 these rule books. Um, so yeah, sex and agriculture, it, it's largely going to be that, I think. Um, but entertainment, of course, another thing that people want is happiness. And we spend a huge amount of money, don't we, on happiness of all sorts. A lot of people, the most expensive thing in their, in their house might be their enormous telly or whatever. They might spend all their, their spare money on, on going to concerts or, or buying records or drugs or whatever. They're trying to make themselves happier by good means or foul. That is the ultimate aim. Um, and so you might imagine that uh, in a fantasy world there'd be an awful lot of the equivalent to special effects uh, to make stage productions uh, more, more wow. Uh, if you want your orchestra to sound better then you might use magic to serve the purpose of a synthesizer or an amplifier or something like that. So yes, entertainment, happiness, uh, attractiveness uh, and wealth. Yeah, yeah, that's the way magic would be, would be channeled. Not into and protection against arrows. Yeah, that's too specialist. So, the next thing I want to talk about is superstition. So, uh, superstition is, if you like, belief in things that are not true. Um, so, if you believe that there are monsters in the world, uh, and there are monsters in the world, that's not superstition. But if you believe in a particular monster in your world that doesn't exist, that'll be superstition. So, if you actually believe in, I don't know, yetis and the Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster or whatever, that is probably, in this the real, real world, a superstition. So you might imagine that whereas in the real world we have superstition because there are people who believe in magic that doesn't actually exist. In a world where magic is actually real, palpably we real, so that when someone does a certain thing, uh, simsala bim, it hap the result happens. Simsala bim, you see it happened again. Simsala bim, simsala bim. You see, every time I, I, I do the thing, the result happens. And 
people know this. They see it because they're familiar with magic. Magic is a thing in their world. So they all know that magic is real. So there's no point in being superstitious because it is actually real. But I think, actually, no, it's more complicated than that. You see, you might say that these people would actually be more superstitious. You see, because they know that magic definitely works, sims a bim, remember? Because they know that, they're going to be more easy to fool. If that piece of magic definitely exists, then another piece of magic might definitely exist. And if someone says, well, if you don't stand on one leg and hop three times every Thursday, a small, cute, furry creature somewhere in the world dies. You can't disprove that because it's somewhere in the world and it's going to be incredibly difficult to find. Um, so you might believe that might actually be true because, because Simba Simba the Bim, psh, that's true. So this other thing could also be true. It'd be easier to convince people of magic if they already are completely and, and rightly convinced of magic. So maybe superstitions would be absolutely rife and everyone would be incredibly superstitious all the time. You could pull the wool over people's eyes so easily. Or, no, no, maybe, maybe let's go the other way. Maybe, um, because they're familiar with magic, when you tell them some rubbish about magic that would never really work because it's just superstition, they'll, they'll immediately spot what you're up to. And no, 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 no. It's like, for instance, in this, the real world, we're very familiar with cars, aren't we? Um, so if someone uh, comes to you and says, oh, yeah, yeah, see this uh, wheelbarrow with a chair in it. It's not a wheelbarrow with a chair in it. It is. It's a wheelbarrow with a chair in it. Uh, it's a car. Well, no, it isn't. It doesn't look anything like a car. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is a car. This is what cars are like. Uh, you, uh, but you won't go now. You have to put petrol in it. It hasn't got an engine. I can see it hasn't got an engine. And there's no way that that's a car. You see, if you're familiar with cars, you can't be fooled with the old chair and wheelbarrow trick. But if you're familiar with magic, then the equivalent of the wheelbarrow and chair trick won't work on you. So, ha! Your guarded, your wisdom, your, your familiarity with, with magic will protect you against charlatans and con men, and you will have no superstition. Phew. Okay. Or, let's think about these people who are in this world. You see, in these fantasy stories, in Lord of the Rings or whatever, these, these, the men in, in Middle Earth, they're just like us. They have all the same foibles and desires and fears and uh, and we understand how they're feeling which is what makes the story interesting because they're like us so they have our sort of, our emotions so we can empathize with them and that's what makes the story interesting so okay so they're essentially like us but in a fantasy world but they're essentially human so they'll have all the self-doubts all the ability to self-delude and They'll have all the same foibles as us. And it seems that, alas, in this, the real world, it doesn't matter how wonderful this world is. It doesn't matter the fact that the, the planet we live on is enormous and you couldn't possibly see it all in your entire life, even if you spent your entire life traveling. And now it's possible to go to just about any part of the world. And there are literally billions of people to meet and cultures and foods to eat and songs to hear. And yet, still, an awful lot of people, actually it seems most people, have this feeling of, ah, yeah, but there must be something more. More? Why need that? Why do you need more? But in a world which had magic in it, if the people are people, they're like us, I think it'd be the same. Even though the world is magic rich, Simtala Bim, see what I mean? Um, oh, and Simtala Bomb, you know, just to be different. Um, yes, there's variety, but they're probably going to be thinking, yeah, yeah, but it's just, you know, it's just... You know, flashes and bangs and the magic. It doesn't really matter. You know, it's every day. I see magic every day. There must be something more, don't you think? So that feeling of there must be something more, I think, would plague even people in a fantasy world rich with magical magic. And, and also people quite like easy answers. And even in a magic-rich world, people would want easy answers. And uh, there'd be dishonest, as dishonest as we are, and so they'll be trying to fool each other by whatever means, so... All right, so I started off by saying that there'd be a lot more uh, um, uh, uh, superstition, and then that there'd be much less, and now I'm going to conclude that I think actually overall there'd be just as much superstition in a fantasy world as there is in this world, and yet superstition is not something that crops up in fantasy stories much. Um, I suppose the, the authors are thinking, well, the, the readers have got so much to, to cope with already, with actual magic, that uh, sticking layers of superstition on top of that is just going to be just too flipping complicated. All right, but maybe there's another way to go. Maybe there would be 
rubbish science in a fantasy world. So people will be uh, let's, you know, the, the, the wheelbarrow and the chair argument. Uh, let's go with that. So people are, you know, they don't get the wool pulled over their eyes with, with magic and, and people trying to, to say, oh, this spell will do this, that and the other. No, it won't. Don't be ridiculous. But maybe they can be bamboozled with rubbish science. Um, now, depressingly few people in this world really understand what a correlation is, and even most scientists seem incapable of, of interpreting one correctly, which is depressing but true. Um, most people have got very poor uh, a grasp of uh, correlation, and that's in this world in which science actually exists. So imagine in a fantasy world where there isn't proper science, almost no one would have any grasp of correlations and statistics. They wouldn't know what a control group was. They wouldn't know what a double blind test was. They, didn't, they wouldn't know the importance of repeatability and all these basic scientific principles. So they'd be vulnerable to charlatans, wouldn't they? And almost every uh, king would never go to war without con without consulting his trusted advisors, his chief scientists in the, the science of war, who would open these amazing books written in arcane languages that only they can read and they're the experts, and they would say, ah, yes, yes, your majesty, uh, it says here that uh, only the horseshoe of this particular shape uh, has scientifically proven to improve uh, the, the, the reliability, the, the steadfastness of your horses as, as they gallop towards the enemy, sir. Uh, yes, uh, of course, uh, these ones uh, would be uh, useful um, north of the equator on, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. But this shape, of course, is what... Oh, right, so we'll have to order loads more horseshoes of these two different shapes because I want my cavalry to be uh, as good as they can be. OK, well, what, what else does it say in the, in, in the book, Master? Ah, well, it's... Uh, and you can imagine that bullshit pseudoscience would be the new magic. People would listen to that. And you could never... You see, it, it has that... You can't confirm it. So, like. What do people use magic for in this, in, in this, the real world? Well, the main thing they seem to use it for is avoiding bad luck. And that's just perfect, isn't it? Avoiding bad luck. So you can, it's something you can never disprove. So someone says that if you do this, that and the other, next month you will avoid bad luck. And you know what? Next month, nothing particularly bad happens. Uh, but, you know, you were a bit unlucky when you played that, that game of cards. And, and you, you might say, well, I seem to have a bit of bad luck. And you, the guy could always say, oh, yeah, yeah, but you, didn't, you don't know what didn't happen to you. All those other things that would have happened to you, but you were protected from because of this, this magic doodah that we did. Yeah, avoiding sort of long-term vague effects you could use science for in the same way. Bad pseudoscience in a fantasy world would perhaps take the place of the daft superstitions and magic that we have in this. All right, um, what about uh, a different sort of magic? That could also work, couldn't it? So um, if you have a world in which there's, 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 there's divine magic that comes from the gods and there's sorcery, which is, comes from the knowledge of the sorcerer's guild or whatever, and there's this kind of magic and that kind of magic, uh, there might also be some completely made up sorts of magic, like, I don't know, number magic, or joint magic. You hold your joints at particular angles and you, you say the magic word and then, then this thing will not happen in the future that was going to badly affect avoiding bad luck again. It, whatever. It's, you can have rubbish magic that doesn't actually work, just a different sort. And because, you know, you could just make this stuff up, you could have loads and loads and loads of school of magics. S some work and some really don't. A bit like in this world, we do actually have actual medicine that actually helps cure people of stuff. And yet homeopathy still exists, which is another type of medicine. It's just different that it doesn't work. Um, so you could have, in a fantasy world, several types of magic, some of which actually work, and some survive despite the fact that they don't. And the proof of that is homeopathy exists. All right. Um, I think uh, perhaps it's time I talked about my sponsor. My mystery sponsor. Who is it really? Well, it was called The Great Courses Plus, but now they have rebranded. They are born again as Wondrium. Yes, Wondrium has all the lecturers um, recording videos uh, from, from, the, from great august uh, seats of learning around the world, but largely east in the US, um, and telling you about all sorts of stuff. But they're branching out now into, into shorter forms uh, and, and the like, and so they've decided that now is the time to become Wondrium. And uh, I was uh, watching uh, one of their lectures recently. Uh, it was from the, the series of uh, Peoples and Cultures uh, of the World. And uh, this particular one I thought I'd watch because I, I knew I was going to be making uh, this. And it was called Magic, Religion and Codes of Conduct. 
And, um, oh, I think, of course, before I go any further, we must uh, illustrate the quality, the sheer quality of the lecturing. Let's have a look at this guy's cradle work. OK, so here he is. Um, you think it's just going to be parallel waving for a bit. But when he gets going, look at that. That is a very precise, very beautifully executed and nicely subtly pulsed as well front cage. And then, uh, oh, look, look, he's, he's a nice knuckle sort of variation on, on the tiptoe and then just into a, like a casual sort of thumb bind and then straight into the clasp at the end. And he makes it look so easy. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're in safe hands if, you, if you're watching this guy. So um, he made an interesting point. Uh, which is that in the book The Golden Bow by uh, Sir James Fraser, oh, which I have come to think of it, it should be over here, uh, and it is, there we go. The, I don't know why I got this out, really, because it's just a book. It's, there you go. So the, Gold, the Golden Bow, it is a book, and it looks like a book. It's actually quite a long book, which, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I like short books. They're so much quicker to read. Uh, but anyway, he makes this point. Um, it's, it's a, sorry, I should say, it's a, you know, a, a seminal work on uh, magic and mythology and the like, uh, look, doing a, using a lot of uh, anthropological studies. So he makes the point that there is a distinction between magic and religion. You see, you may think that, well, since religions require a belief in the supernatural gods that have magical powers and the like, that religion is essentially magic. Well, he says, no, magic... Um, is a formula. So if you do X, Y, and Z properly and in the right order and on the right day of the year, then there will be a result, ta-da, and it will happen. It will happen because you've done the magic which will cause the thing. You did that. You did the magic. You did the formula, and then the result will be the thing. So you, if you get some wood and a chisel and you go blah, 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 and you do this, you will end up with a cartwheel. If you do it right, you will end up with a cartwheel. That's magic. But um, religion is different. In religion, you don't cast a spell. You offer a prayer to a divine being who may or may not be listening. And even if he or she is listening, might decide to do nothing or even go against you. They can be, they can be capricious. They can be, uh, they can be deaf. Um, uh, perhaps uh, the reason that... Uh, the first time you did the prayer, the thing happened, hooray, but the second time you did the prayer, the thing didn't happen, it was different. Well, maybe in a monotheistic world, that's because the second thing wasn't part of God's great plan, which you don't know about. Whatever. The idea is you offer a prayer, but you do not have any reason to expect any particular result. So if something, you do a thing, and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, that's religion. If you do a thing and yup, it'll do the thing, that's magic. So that, uh, that, you know, that was the, the fact that I was reminded of, um, which I, I read in that book years ago, but I did, I did read that book a very long time ago. Goodness knows where my notes are. Um, and I seem to have gone a little bit astray from what I was... Oh, yes, right, so Wondrium. Uh, yes, so um, they've got a free uh, introductory offer on. And if you go to uh, wondrium.com stroke Lindy Beige, there you will find uh, details of a free introductory offer. You can have a look around the site, watch some lectures, see if you like it. And if you do, then then you can become a, a, a long-term subscriber. And they'll, they'll, your brain will love you if you do that. Uh, because, oh, the knowledge, frankly, the knowledge. Um, so you can you can go to that link, or you can just, the, the description to this video has got a, a link. You can click that, and then you can find out more. So there you go. Wondrium. Now, back to the meat of this, um, I nearly called it a lecture, uh, um, this video. So, um, if we have a magical world, a fictional world that feels completely real to the people in it, they have their, 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 their feelings, just as we do, and from observing, observing, uh, observing Westeros and, and Middle Earth and all those others, the people are essentially people. I mean, Aragorn, he weighs as much as a man the size of Aragorn. They have gravity. They have light and darkness. Uh, the laws of physics seem to be pretty much the same, apart from there's this magic stuff. Well, if light behaves the same way um, and, and, and mass behaves the same way, then shouldn't perhaps magic fit in with that sort of world? In which case... When a wizard casts a spell, and it has this amazing effect, great bolts of energy leap from his fingers, where did the energy for, to make that happen come from? 
Because energy can be converted from one form into another, but it can't just be summoned out of nothing. There has to be a cost. And it makes a story more interesting, don't you think, if there is a cost to magic. So, where did the energy for the lightning bolt come from? Well, uh, in the rule books in these games, and in most uh, stories that I've read, it doesn't sort of come from anywhere. It just, just, just sum it up from Simsalabim, and there it is! But I think it's much better if we say, no, 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 no. Energy has to come from somewhere. So, um, heat, there's an obvious source. So, um, the sun has been beating down on this rock all day and has heated up quite a bit, and the wizard wants to cast a spell, so he puts his hand on the hot uh, rock and he says, Alakazam! And boom, the thing happens. And if anyone then goes over and puts his hand on the rock, they will find, ooh. It's all cold. And this is a, a common trope, isn't it? In horror stories, when something magical happens in the room, everyone feels a little bit cold. In horror films, they sometimes show someone's breath, don't they, to, to make you feel, ooh, ooh, it's, it's, it's chilling. Some magic has happened and it's taken the heat out of the room. So maybe uh, a wizard who needs a little bit more energy than just the, the, the little bit of that's uh, held in the, in the air in a room needs something uh, a, a bigger source of heat, might take it from a hot rock. But wait a minute, what if he needs a really powerful spell, right? Okay, so he is, oh, this, oh, this is a huge spell. Okay, right, so if we're going to use heat, a massive roaring bonfire. Oh, you, you, you can't stand within 10 f feet of it without just bursting into sweat. This is one a hell of a roaring bonfire. Look at it go, the flames go 20 feet up into the air. Right, that's going to provide enough energy for one hell of a spell. Uh, but I, do I need to touch the fire in order, because remember he was touching the rock and he took the, the energy from the rock into himself. His body acted as a conduit and his knowledge transformed it and then with the, the words and the gestures he turned it into the zap. Well, um, I, that's my, right, I'm gonna have to, uh, so maybe that is the cost. If you want to harvest the energy from that fire, you have to touch that fire. You have to plunge your hand into that roaring inferno. And if you tell, if you, if you cast the spell immediately, then maybe boom, the whole bonfire goes out and is immediately cold. And whew, ha, you just got some singed hairs on your hand because it was that quick. But of course, if you mistimed it, if someone else had to play a part in casting the spell and he was a little bit slow and stuttered or whatever, you could get a hideously burned hand. Ah, God, why did you say it fast? Sorry, sorry, I have only just learned this. I'm working with amateurs. You can imagine there's some peril here, but maybe he just has to feel it. Maybe if he could put on a, a, a thick insulated glove and plunge that into the fire and then feel the heat surging up through him, that would act as a conduit enough and then maybe he could cast the spell and then whoo, whoo, take ha, his hand out of ha, ha, a now smouldering glove. But uh, whew, that worked. The, if you could just take the heat from the, uh, from the fire remotely, then you might say, well, during the day, absolutely everyone in the world would just say, um, uh, the sun. I, I'll, I'll take all the energy I need for whatever it is from the sun, because that just has more energy than I'm ever going to need. And although there's an interesting story there, because if everyone in the entire world kept taking energy from the sun, maybe there could be some long term environmental uh, disaster impending. Someone might um, realize, hey, uh, guys, if we keep taking all the energy from the sun, that could be really bad long term. I think it's sort of, I don't think, because like an environmental story there. But that, that, that's, that's not, I think personally, it's not good to have a, uh, an ability to just remotely take energy from, from wherever. Oh, I'll take it from the orbit of the moon. Uh, yeah, that just means that anyone can do anything again and then you don't have a very interesting world. But the idea that someone has to, has to plunge his hand into an inferno in order to, to use the power of that inferno, now yeah, that's dramatic. That's magic. Okay, so uh, there's, there's heat. What else? Uh, there's light. Uh, it's not needs so much energy. The trouble with light is it moves ever so fast and if you if you take the energy out of a tiny bit of light that's just traveling across the room, it's a tiny amount of energy. And then if it's gone, how would you know? Because you, your eyes don't work that fast. I, I think that harvesting light energy directly sort of doesn't work. You, I mean, you can't send the entire world dark because you've taken the light out of the air, because that's, that's not how it works. And even if you did somehow take all the light out of the air, 
the world would come immediately bright again before you could you could register it because new light would come in at the speed of light to replace it. So yeah, I don't think you've got the drama, on, and I don't think that the physics works quite so well. So maybe maybe not light. Oh, how about stored energy in the form of of like a bent spring? Quite like that. So uh, imagine it's a windy day and there's a big oak tree and this oak tree, the whole oak tree is huge. It weighs many, many tons and the whole tree is bending this way in the breeze, which is catching all the leaves. There's a huge amount of stored energy in that huge tree bent like that. So you run over to it and, and you hug the tree and then you cast the spell and <laughs> the spell happens and you harvest all that, that energy stored in the tree. But then what happens to the tree? Um, maybe it gets sort of set like that. It loses its springiness, and the next time there's a storm, uh, the, perhaps the, the the branches will snap because they don't have that spring left into them. Uh, when you're underground in the dungeon and there's, you have no ready access to oaks in wind, uh, then uh, perhaps one of the archers will bend his big war bow, and you'll put your hand. You're the wizard now on that war bow, and and abracadabra, you do the thing, and bang, and everyone applauds because it was very good and then you say thank you archer and then the archer lets go of the string and it just sort of goes all flibbity flobbity and his bow is now set permanently uh, in that new position it's a bit of a rubbish bow uh, that's that's one interpretation uh, but you could come up with others it could for instance go all just sort of flibbity flobbity and oh, okay i had a bow and now i seem to have six feet of weird wooden rope um Anyway, you take the energy out of something, there has to be a cost, right? Otherwise, it's not dramatic. Um, so uh, that's... Oh, by the way, this just reminds me of... There's, not only is there where the energy comes from, there's also sometimes, with some spells, where does the matter come from? So imagine you're casting um, a, a Tempest. This one, every time there's, there's a spell in some game or story where someone's the size of a dragon and summons his this tempest that blasts its enemies away from in front of him you think okay so there's a body of air in front of the wizard which suddenly moves in that direction really really fast but it's not just a sudden whoop, is it it's it's a which goes on for quite a few seconds well if that's the case more air must be coming in to replace the air that has now moved that way and is, is not here anymore so where's that coming from well the office place is from behind you but if that's the case, you say, I summon a tempest and... Oh, no! Wow! I didn't think that through. Um, you'd be pushed towards your enemies. So maybe uh, you think, OK, right, I shall cast the tempest. Right, everyone, uh, chain yourself to a tree. You, that rock will do. You get in the trench and you, you have to tie on, on yourself onto a big tree. It's a lot of preparation now. Uh, but now, OK, right, here we go, everyone. And then you cast the tempest and then uh, hang on for dear life. And again, it's more dramatic, isn't it? Um, but if you were underground in a in a, a corridor, for instance, you, and at the end of this uh, corridor there's a there's a sealed iron door and you can't get through it. And you've been trying for some while, and what's that? Oh no, orcs! Orcs coming at us with their their bows and poisoned arrows. Uh, I got this, says the mage. Okay. <laughs> Fazam! Okay, he casts his Tempest spell and it blows those orcs right down the corridor and the air from where you are goes rushing after them and you cannot be replaced because you're underground and there's, these are solid walls and solid doors so you've now created a vacuum where you are which will then suck all that air back. Oh, here come the orcs and their poison arrows at very high speed. Oh, I didn't think that through. So it'd be a sort of a ha ha! Oh, no, no, and then they'll come back at you. Um, so there you go. Sometimes you have to think the physics through. Um, uh, so where was I? Um, uh, spring. Oh, yeah, right. So um, wind and water power. Now, you can have um, the, the fluid thing, be it air or water, turning a turbine like a windmill or a water mill, and then you could harvest some of the energy of that turning. So you could just put your hand on the, the, the center of the spinning thing, so you're physically touching it, harvest some of the energy of that rotation, and of course what you do then is you'd actually slow the water wheel or the windmill down, uh, which would mean that it, that it wouldn't grind flour very well. You'd be, you'd be harming the efficiency of the water wheel. But if you were, were just taking modest amounts of quite constant uh, energy out of that water wheel, then that could work. So maybe uh, water mills might be uh, places for, I don't know, slow charging magic crystals or something. So you could possibly get some out of it. Now, 
an obvious one, well, I don't know, um, I don't know how obvious this is, but you know, falling objects. Just think how much energy there is in a socket great big boulder that someone's just pushed off a cliff. Oh, brilliant. Well, we in this actual world have things that are high up that could be just pushed down. But have we come up with a way of, of harvesting the energy from falling objects very efficiently? Are there any power stations that are powered by large boulders falling? No, there aren't. How would you harvest that? So if, you, if you've got to touch it, that's going to be a big problem. So you're going to have to sort of put your hand on this boulder that's falling at high speed. So you'd have to move at very high speed with it, which would take a huge amount of energy. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's not going to work. Ah, of course, the impact when it finally hits. OK, well, if it has to touch you, that's not great. Is it I mean, a bit of a dramatic and a novel way to commit suicide, I suppose? You could have a massive boulder. And if you just time it just right, just as you cast the spell, just as you touch it, and then it splatters you into the ground, uh, then you can harvest quite a bit of energy with a really big side effect. Um, and, and yes, and timing, even if you weren't, uh, if you're just nearby and, and trying to harvest from, from remotely, uh, mm, the timing would have to be perfect. And, no, um, and things that are at rest, that are just very heavy, but not moving, it's not a form of energy that, that we, can, we can harvest. See, gravity probably works the same way in the fantasy world as it does in reality. And we don't have, we don't have things that are powered by some things just being very heavy. Or falling very rapidly. So I'm perfectly uh, happy to uh, imagine that in a fantasy world there are forms of energy which, though great, just cannot be practically harvested. Um, but with water flowing in a river you could say, well that is a falling object, it's water that's constantly sort of falling sort of sideways. But how do you, how do you harvest that? Like if you step into a river and you're now touching the river, how much of the river are you touching? Is it just the water that's actually in contact with your skin? Is, is that the only bit that you can harvest the energy from? Because if that's the case, that's not really very much. Um, it's, it's the weight of water that's pushing against you. Um, there's the temperature of the water, of course. You could, you could harvest the heat uh, of the water, uh, but if you overdo that, of course, how you might get a chill. If you really overdo it, you might suddenly be encased in ice. And, oh, oh, uh, that wasn't such a good idea. It was a good spell, though, wasn't it? Um, but if you are, many years ago, my brother uh, claimed that he never fell off that barge in Egypt, uh, but I was sure that he was in denial. <laughs> okay, uh, when I watched um, La La Land, uh, there's the bit near the end where she's uh, having the audition and uh, she said that her aunt lived in Paris and then jumped into the water. And I was just thinking, I just wanted one of the people, one of the auditioners to say, she must have been insane. But nobody said it. I think, how did they miss that gag? Uh, so every time I see the film, uh, I quite like the film, uh, I say, she must have been insane. And I, I think you should, you should start saying the same. Anyway, um, if you're in the Nile, in denial, um, if you harvest the energy of the movement of the water, because it's all moving together, are you harvesting it right the way from the mouth of, 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 of the delta right the way up to Victoria, um, uh, Lake Victoria? I, I suggest not. So how do I explain this then? Well, other forms of energy in the real world, like light and heat and sound and the like, um, they obey the uh, inverse square law. So uh, if I shout, Oi! and someone is 10 yards from me, and he hears it at, at a certain volume, then someone else who is, say, 30 yards from me, three times as far, will hear it one-third as loud. Will he? No, he won't. He'll hear it one-ninth as loud because it's the, in, it's the, it's the inverse square. So the drop-off of sound away from me, drop-off of heat if I'm very hot, drop-off of light if I'm very bright, whatever it is, the drop-off of energy obeys the inverse square law. So if you're trying to harvest the energy from a river, say, then you can harvest the energy from the, the water very close to you um, quite efficiently, and then there's a very rapid and steep drop-off uh, obeying the inverse square law. I think that's perfectly reasonable, and it would stop people saying, oh, I use all the energy in the entire Nile, and I use it to annihilate the army, because that would be an awful lot of energy. Um, and uh, that's all I'm going to say about uh, water power for the moment. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit further, and Vibration. That's it. I was going to talk about vibration. So sound is a form of vibration. So you could use it um, for quietening uh, the world. So if there's a very, very noisy, noisy battle, for instance, ha and happening, there's a lot of noise in the air, a lot of vibration in the air, you could use that to power some magic, cast a spell, and the result would be everything would go quiet for a while. 
um, and maybe wizards would have tuning forks and they could go ding and in the restaurant they could they could then say ah and you hear it suddenly goes quiet and everyone will look round and think oh that wizard's just cast a spell don't see that anything's changed though and they go back to eating but there'd be a dramatic moment when the thing that was vibrating suddenly stops um, Drama. We're in, you know, with the, the, the fantasy worlds. We're in it for drama, right? So let's, let's, let's go with the drama. So, if, um, for instance, let's go back with a falling object. Let's imagine there's a runaway cart. It's it's a little bit out of control, but it's not going so fast at this point that the wizard can't run down the road if he's young enough and sprightly enough uh, and and catch it. So he could run down the road and put his hand on the cart, cast a spell, any spell, doesn't matter, whatever it, whatever he wants. It, it sounds like a peal of bells, ding dong, and just just he uses the energy of the rolling cart to power the spell, and the cart will then come to a halt. And ah, who? Okay. Now, even though it's still on a slope and could still roll, it's because it's a halt. It's not no longer a runaway cart, and he can just about hold it for long enough for someone to come along and put the brakes on. Um, so, um, if you can stop a cart. Maybe you could stop something else. Rotational energy. Remember the water wheel? Remember the windmill? Maybe the best thing to use that won't involve your plunging your arm into a, an inferno, for instance, would be a flywheel. Yeah, so you have a really big flywheel, like a big grinding stone or something. You have a, a couple of guys uh, doing this, and you say to them, okay, right, right, let go, guys, let go, guys, because this is gonna this is gonna work. And you then put your hand, and I imagine you could you could put it on the surface of the of the grindstone if it's reasonably smooth without doing too much damage to your hand or maybe you could have some bit right in the center of the axle uh, which is just spinning on the end of your on the end of your finger like that so you're touching the source of the energy and then you could cast the hocus pocus pedal the the spell and then the spell takes place and the wheel becomes stationary boom this massive stone flywheel just choom, stops but it wouldn't be dangerous, it would be quite controllable, you could spin at a controlled speed. There are a lot of advantages to using a flywheel for powering magic. Admittedly, if you're on an adventure, carrying a massive flywheel with you uh, would be inconvenient, but I can think that in a lot of stations, uh, a lot of castles, a lot of um, towns, a flywheel for powering magic, yeah, yeah, that might be, that might be the way they went, and then you can you could use animals to to you could put an, a, a, a dog in a, a little treadmill thing and use the dog to, to power the, the, the treadmill. You could have um, the, the the flywheel I meant. Uh, you could have you uh, for smaller things you could have a goose, and then for really big ones you could have a, a man or a horse or a team of horses. And then I thought to myself, well, there's almost no limit to this because. Imagine a really big civilization like ancient Egypt, a civilization capable of making the pyramids. If that got to work on a really big flywheel, it could carve the flywheel out of the living rock in situ. It's not going to move it anywhere. They just find a bit of a rock that doesn't appear to have any big uh, cracks in it, a big cliff face, and then they, they just chip away. And not just the flywheel, but huge supports next to the flywheel. And they don't chip away the bottom of the flywheel where it touches the, the ground beneath it. Uh, they, they leave that attached but, but until they've, they've finished all the massive supports either side. And then they chip away the sides such that they then have something like an axle coming out of the center bit. And then they have to chip away and chip away and try to separate that from the supports. And then when they're ready, they can put loads and loads of huge, huge, massive trees and rocks and boulders and all sorts as supports for the main flywheel as they then peck away with rocks and, and bronze chisels uh, over years and years and years until they finally separate this and with great ceremony but also trepidation this thing finally is it going to be perfectly balanced it's going to be so difficult but maybe they get the, the geometry of it just right and the, the rock is consistent enough in in density so that it all balances and now how are they going to turn it how are they going to turn such an enormous thing well they could have huge gear mechanisms of it connected to other gear on it, connected to other gear mechanisms, connected to enormous great treadmills that take huge teams of horses, maybe eight horses at a time, and the only way to get a horse off when it's when the thing's going fast is to get the train the horses in advance to jump off and they land in a big pool of water, and that's how you get the horses off when they're trying to keep it 
uh, st st still spinning and then you then got get other horses up to speed on lesser treadmills and then somehow transfer them across and this is really complicated and and the friction think of the incredible friction in the wheel and the wear and the wear so maybe you need spells to lower the friction but how do you power those spells ah what well, you have is you have more treadmill you have you have more treadmills powering other um uh, flywheels which then are used to power the spells to lower the friction and and to deal with the, the heat build up and the and the wear on the huge bearings on the colo absolutely colossal hundreds upon hundreds of tons of flywheel that's now going faster and faster as you introduce more horses and, and engage more gears. Once you've got it going up pretty fast, you can then engage yet more gears and then get more horses on and oh my goodness, this thing has got so much energy in it. And then a, a mage steps up onto the platform he has been given the honor of casting the th the first expel uh, spell from this thing now they're not actually at war at this point but they want to demonstrate to their enemies what they could do if anyone tries to invade this city this is what they're up against and so he sees that this huge hub of spinning uh, stone and he seems right in the very very center they've polished it smooth is, is the center bit where he can put his finger on this huge stone uh, rotation thing without coming to any any harm and then he realizes that this is the moment and everyone's watching he better get this right and he casts his easy wheezy let's get busy kaboo and he does the thing and phew, there's a tremendous flash and everyone's aghast and then they see this sort of charred lump where there was a wizard and it's learned for the first time that when you've got that kind of amount of magical energy going straight through the body of a wizard, it's, it, that's too much energy and he's just fried. So then they think, okay, well maybe there's some other way. Remember I said earlier that you could harvest the heat from something? Maybe you could harvest heat from a, a hot piece of metal. It's hot at one end, but you, you just hold the other end so you don't burn your hand too much, but you can feel the heat traveling down. It, maybe that's a, a conduit enough. And maybe magic can go through metal in, in ways that it can't go through other things. It's, it's, it's conducted like a wire. Uh, so maybe that would, and you could cast a spell and then the end of the, the glowing bit of, uh, of, of uh, metal would then go cold and dark. Uh, okay, so if that works, that would explain for one thing why wizards don't wear metal armor because the, the magic won't go through their body and be transformed by their techniques and leap out as a magic spell. It'll just go through the armor instead. But maybe you could use that um, to create a sort of Faraday cage around the, the next wizard who steps up with greater reputation <clears throat> to try out this thing. And they think, well, maybe we'll just try it at half speed this time, okay? Uh, so they build a big sort of Faraday so, so that the energy doesn't go straight through his body, but he's still in contact with it so he can still encamp the spell and maybe this will work. And then eventually they get it together somehow. And this civilization is able to lay waste to an army with a single spell. And everyone will know exactly where the energy came from. Uh, but of course, if he's tricked into casting that spell too early, just think how long it's going to take them to get the wheel back up to speed. Or what if enemy saboteurs are able to work out some weakness to, 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 to um, you know, there might be some strange fundamental weakness that will, that, you know, like the Death Star, um, that will uh, spell the end to this super weapon. And there's a story, isn't there? Okay, so, um, in summary then, so, um, yeah, uh, most spells will be for, for agriculture and, and for making people like you, uh, and uh, most, um, uh, I think most people would have the same amount of superstition that we have in this world, and there will be still lots of charlatans peddling fake magic that doesn't work, and the energy has to come from somewhere.